So these are some of my self-portraits from high school. And there's some from a little later. I stopped trying to make them look like me at a certain point. Or even having anything whatsoever to do with me. But it's still called autobiography. I think at, at the most, I think of the figures in my work to be sort of surrogates. But anymore, they're not even surrogates of me. They're just potential people. Here's some close-ups. None of this ever happened to me. I was never stuck down in a well. Well, I have a run for the toilet, but I've never been lost on a desert island. <laughs> I didn't drink until I was legal. Stuff like that. <clears throat> I also have this sort of weird interest uh, in abstraction, or I don't know if you'd even call it abstraction. On the left is something from when I was about four years old. It's a multiplication table, and that is exactly what math looks like me to this very day. And <laughs> I think it's an excellent representation of a times table. And on the right is a multiplication table from a few years back. This odd thing happened to me about, um, what year is that, 2004. Around 2003, my gallery told me that museums were interested in my work, but they wanted a typical Schechter. This, instead of being the best news I ever had, sent me into the vortex of hell and really deeply questioning what this meant. I knew exactly what they meant. They wanted sort of a distorted, agonized woman against a background of vivid patterning. And I had to think, oh, do I really mean it? Because I've, it, I don't want it to be like a brand. And so I worked abstractly for a little while. It didn't take, it just couldn't, but because <laughs> it's just not really me. But here you go, here's some examples of that. This was my riffing on the idea of a rose window from a cathedral. When I was a teenager, um, I got very interested in lace making. Lace making is the kind of thing you do when you are sort of urgently trying to repress your sexuality and channel it into something that keeps your hands very, very busy. So um, I would say <laughs> lace making has something to do with this image, but there you go, nothing personal. So here I am in high school. Uh, I was too angry to even submit a pithy quote underneath my name. And <laughs> this is my teenage taste in art. Mad Magazine and the sort of psychedelic sci-fi um, stuff and album covers. So I was sort of making images that were kind of reminiscent of this in high school. At the same time, all my life, I've been a, an inveterate doodler. And I would, these are scraps that have been cut off pages of notes and homework that would always be returned to me with comments, stop doodling in the margins of your pages. So um, I collected them and saved them. So this is kind of what I was doing, what my artwork looked like in high school when I wasn't trying to imitate Mad Magazine. And all of this leads to me going to art school. And there I am as a freshman at RISD with a really goofy haircut. Um, I think I may or may, it's hard to say if I had some intuitive understanding of art before art school. Um, but art school, of course, is a very peculiar and wonderful and traumatic experience in many ways in trying to become an artist. I would say um, art to me was a very, very, very serious endeavor. The first thing I did was I was a painting major because I thought I was going to be a painter. My grandmother was a painter. And uh, I had taken a lot of Saturday painting classes. So I went into the painting department. And the sophomore year of painting at RISD was given over to painting nude models, still lives, and the occasional landscape. And this is an example of a sophomore still life by me. And so you don't, I did not, no one has to think. You are given the subject matter 
and you just sit there and you try to do something with it. Um, this is a little bit of a later painting, and this is what I meant by violence in my work, and this is sort of the end of the line for me. It was based on a tarot card, just in case you're wondering, and it's quite large. It's six feet by four feet on a panel. So I started out as a painter, and I started out painting the model. I understood from my painting teachers that there were three very important things that I needed to um, uh, understand, and that was that I should not be decorative, I should not be illustrative, and I shouldn't be craftsy. These were sins. And if they never said exactly why, but if the teacher told me my piece was reminiscent of illustration, I understood that that was an occasion for great shame and perhaps suicidal thoughts. And <laughs> um, they, like I said, they, I don't know if they explained, they probably did. I, I should give them the benefit of a doubt and say that they explained what the hell they were talking about, but I don't remember what the explanation was. Something to do with the, with the distinction between the fine arts and lower art forms. <coughs> oh, look, Kristen, this seems to be in this lecture, too. When it comes to the idea of decoration, I was v I'm very interested in decoration to this day. I call myself a militant ornamentalist. And I will tell you, this is here to, to describe the notion that man cannot live by bread alone. I don't have the other slide. I will tell you, the, it is completely obvious when you look at the history of, of the human race that after our bare essentials are taken care of, meaning food, shelter, and procreation, we decorate our cave. And if you want to cast dispersions on that activity, that's fine. I don't. I think that it is one of the most important things about being a human being is that we have a need to embellish. And that this embellishment isn't frivolous. It's not a form of entertainment. It's not necessarily because we're bored. I could go into this at length, but it would be truly at length. I will s the, the short answer is that I believe it has to do with the fact that we can transcend ourselves and become greater than our own ego. <clears throat> with regard to illustration, I think one of the things that most f upset my professors was that my work was figurative, which had become sort of a synonym for illustration. And that uh, most of my teachers were abstract expressionists, in other words. And uh, this is a, uh, a brief history of figuration from the Venus of Illendorf up to Rodin. The figure has tens of thousands of years of history and art, and we have like, you know, two generations of people crabbing about it. I choose not to listen. Every single culture does figuration. Here's a bunch of cultures. We have neurons that are geared to find figuration in every last thing available to our eyeballs. And if artists don't do figures, we will find it in popular culture, you know? We don't really need to look at the weatherman. Or is that the traffic reporter? I don't know. But there is figures everywhere in popular culture. So if artists don't provide them, we'll be stuck looking at all the other ones, which is not my favorite idea. Or we'll be looking, you know, at these. Because the appetite in human beings to look at other human beings is insatiable. Check this out. It's true for monkeys, too. <laughs> if you give monkeys cherry juice, a choice between cherry juice and erotic close-ups of female monkeys. <laughs> they will choose <laughs> the erotic close-ups. <laughs> Go figure. <laughs> so I'm just saying, if artists want to abdicate from this responsibility, that's fine. But the gap will be filled. <laughs> As for the idea of craft, 
Uh, you really don't want to get me started on this one because this is the one that is nearest and dearest to my heart in some ways. Um, I've had to rationalize craft and art and explain the differences and the similarities and, you know, sacrifice chickens all in the name of this for years now. But I would say that there's a lot of craft anxiety, especially among craftspeople who are desperate to um, have the prestige and the prices that the fine arts command. But I don't think that the, the craftspeople really take this on as though it were their problem. What it really is, in my mind, is the problem of the fine arts in protecting their little niche. I'm not listening. Sometimes the difference between craft versus art tends to break down very, very clearly on mind versus uh, body lines. And I'm steadfastly opposed to any division between the mind and the body. I mean, only because I've suffered from being an idiot in that regard myself, so I can see what harm it does. All right, back to me. Um, when I went to RISD, I ended up being a glass major, mainly because I, this is my very first stained glass window. I, um, I, went, I used to go to the Metcalf building where the graduate painting studios were, and that's where the glass studios were. And I saw the glass students making stained glass windows. I know um, most people who walk into a glass shop get really obsessed with glass blowing because there's a lot of really good looking men with their shirts off in there and there's fire and people are dancing around and it's really seductive and amazing. But <laughs> that did not move me. I went into the stained glass room and I just, I look, without even ever having touched it, I knew I wanted to do it. <clears throat> so one of the things that um, I thought was that stained glass was junk. Even though I desperately wanted to be making it myself and it looked very, very exciting, I thought it was sort of along the lines of, you know, macrame plant holders and oven mitts in terms of what it was as an art form. So here I was in my painting classes and I, it, I was struggling, struggling to figure out why my teachers were withholding the important information of the secret of finding your voice as an artist. And I think I really believed that my teachers were withholding this information as a form of torture because they were evil. Um, I, uh, I took the stained glass class and I had to design a window and I just put two and two together and decided to do my doodles because stained glass was a junk art form and my doodles were junk according to everybody. And the minute I realized that my doodles were what, it was like the last scene in The Wizard of Oz where she wakes up and she says, I've been looking for it everywhere and all this time it was in my own backyard. That's what it was like. I had been looking for the secret of art externally in my professors, in the history of art, in uh, imitating Giotto, which was my hobby for a while, and nothing resonated. But when I mixed stained glass with my doodles, I suddenly became um, probably a nightmare to my teachers, but it was a great moment for me. Um, no longer could I be critiqued. They could say anything they wanted, and it was like the tap of a dull butter knife on the heel of my shoe. I knew, I knew something was happening, but I didn't feel much. And because I felt I was in love with this, and you know, no one can, anyone who tries to take love away from you is an asshole, pardon me for saying that. So I, I just, I couldn't stop. I mean, they could tell me to stop, but I wouldn't. So here are some of my very first windows. They were all horribly gruesome. Uh, here's the, on the left is an old window, and on the right is a later remake. I actually much prefer the earlier one. Sometimes I get a little too refined. Um, and then I wanted to talk a little bit about some of the people who were my heroes as uh, as artists, not necessarily for their artworks, but for their careers. 
So when I was a young, young artist, I, I, I would have told you if you had asked that I wanted to be famous, very famous. And I remember um, some of my friends telling me what an incredibly superficial goal that was and that I would uh, not always feel that way. But um, I certainly felt that way at the time. And I thought, I understood that it took a long time to become famous, so I basically scheduled in six months in my calendar. And uh, boy, was I wrong about that. But anyway, these were sort of the people I admired and wanted my career to be like. Although I liked their artwork as well, or I wouldn't have included them. But it was mainly the, the way they ran their lives, their art careers, that impressed me. So after RISD, I moved to Philadelphia. So this is a, you recognize Philly in these images? <laughs> and in Philadelphia, I pursued my uh, dream of being a rock star, because I wanted to do that too. So I played in some bands, uh, and that was a lot of fun. The main thing I think I learned from playing in bands was how to fail spectacularly in public. Um, if you can bring yourself to do that, you will be a, um, have superpowers. And I highly recommend it because you will be therefore released from the incredible self-consciousness uh, and fear of the opposite. And I did fail spectacularly numerous times in this band. <laughs> there are the two of them, but... Um, <clears throat> Here are some of the early windows I made when I first moved to Philadelphia. This is basically five or six years worth of work, actually. I had other jobs for a while. I thought it was interesting to make these images so that I could see them all at once myself. It also was profoundly weird to post them on Facebook. All right, and now I will go launch into a uh, long uh, thing that is both a survey of the work from like 1990 through 2000 and at the same time be discussing the topic of where do you get your ideas. The answer is I do not know where I get my ideas from but I will try to talk about this in a way that is um, useful. Stealing is a very good way I get ideas. And this is from 1983, when I first moved to Philadelphia. Um, you know, I guess it was Picasso who said, uh, great artists steal and lesser artists borrow. So always steal and don't borrow. Here's some a little bit later work. The thing to me is that inspiration is completely undescribable, uh, except by cliches, unfortunately. Um, a lot of uh, my experience of discussing inspiration is that there's no moment I can identify when I was actually inspired. If I go back and look at the experience of making a piece with hindsight, the idea of having had an idea just seems to evaporate. I have on occasion thought that I have had an idea, only to discover that when I am confronted with actual material, that my idea turned out to be nothing at all. So almost everything is derived through the drawing process. This was basically designed after reading Stephen King's book, It, by the way. And this was loosely uh, constructed around the notion of uh, the idea of romantic love, like lovers sort of floating in slow motion through a field be united. Um, the original conception of the piece was that the dragons were around the girl. That drawing was the entire window. But I ended up taking all of the dragons out and moving them over to the left and separating it with a line. You can read into that what you will. I have no opinion or thoughts on the matter. Uh, I would say that Something I'm very concerned with is cliches and uh, visual cliches, something like this. These all come from women running from houses, blogspot.com, an actual website given over to one of my favorite 
genres of art. Um, I, I guess things become cliche because they're important. I don't see any reason why they can't be rehabilitated and made important once again. So that is my folly to attempt to do this. Um, like every good artist, I'm influenced by Japanese prints. In this case, I'm very, very influenced by Japanese prints. Here's a little bit later. This piece, I think I have an image of it. Yes. Oh my God, uh, how I hate this Bronzino painting. I hate it with all my might. I just think it's the most perverted, disgusting thing I ever saw, ever. Um, however, I did, <laughs> I did think it would be a good idea to make art based on it. The idea of this triptych was that if you close the outside panels, which of course you can't do because it's exhibited in a light box and nothing moves, but if you could close those outside panels, there would be nothing too horribly dirty about it. And there's the sketch.